afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. Two very distinctive world-class garden exhibitions were held recently just north of the border. And so today we're going to see some spectacular pictures from these exhibits in Ottawa and Montreal. Our tour guide this afternoon is Leonard Perry from UVM. Great to see you again. Great to be back, Judy. So what were these world-class exhibits that you saw and photographed? Okay, Judy. Uh, the first was uh, in, near Ottawa. It wasn't in Ottawa. It was actually in Gatineau, right across the river. And this was mosaic culture. Some people may remember there was a show in Montreal 2013. Mm -hmm. Well, this uh, this year celebrated 150 years of Canadian history. Over 40 of these sculptures, larger than life, all made of plants. And I've got some pictures we'll see in a few minutes of those. As well as then uh, the Montreal Botanic Gardens had their usual Chinese Lantern Show, which is one of the top in the world. And it changes each year with different exhibits. And we'll take a look at some of those. So we're going to start near Ottawa. Let's start near Ottawa in Gatineau mm -hmm. at the Mosaic Culture Exhibit. And again, these are uh, sculptures, three-dimensional, uh, with plants growing in those. They differ from topiaries, which have plants like vines growing around right. them. But these are planted within, and we'll show you how that works. But here's an example, over 30 feet high. And this is, uh, represents several things. It's called an Inukshuk. And that was um, a landmark that uh, humans made up in the Arctic areas of Canada and you can still see up there out of stone or whatever as landmarks. It's pretty barren and flat, so mm -hmm. they made it some way to see what's going on. The design in this is the northern lights that one can see up there, yeah. and there are arctic wolves up there, so you can see that at the base, and then all the beautiful plantings at the base, too. So just an example of, of one of these. It's pretty spectacular. Also, up in the northern part in the province of Nunavut, um, the native peoples have these uh, dancing drummers that they use for celebration. So here's one again, the larger than life. Uh, we can see the expression, uh, one of the drummers from the Arctic region. Now this is a little different. It's a two-dimensional. Now Canada minted some coins and this was in celebration again of their 150th. And so you can see here the elaborate detail. These are again all plants planted in this two-dimensional frame that have to be trimmed so they don't grow together. Um, and the original mosaics uh, came about in the 1870s in France and they were two-dimensional, uh, similar to this one. But now you see the three dimensions. What they have is a welded frame. They cover it with a fabric, kind of like the weed fabric we know. Mm -hmm. Fill it with soil, um, and then they plant within that. So all the roots are going inside and they have to keep it watered and trimmed. So that's just an example of how they work. Now some of these were similar to the 2013 show in Montreal. This was one of the most spectacular there as it was here, one of the largest. This is Mother Earth celebrating uh, the connection of humans with the earth and the animals and the water flowing out of the hand. Again, in the hair all done in different flowers of various sorts. A lot of uh, Santalina and sedges and Alternanthera, the, the red leaf forms, uh, of course flowers and so forth. Incredible. Now, were other parts of Canada represented? They were, not just the northern part. And mm -hmm. I thought it'd be fun to take a trip across Canada in the next couple of minutes, okay. uh, going from east to west, and uh, showcase some of these. Uh, starting with this one, which is a train, of course. Again, except for the wheels and the light, things like that, which are either wood or metal, um, all those are plants. Again, probably that dark alternanthera pruned, um, like we can use in our bedding. This is a Canadian Pacific 374, which was the first trained across Canada from Montreal to Vancouver in May 23 of 1887. That's all sunflowers and they're all in pots so they can actually pull them out Put a whole new exhibit in overnight. Incredible. Uh, so that was that was pretty special. I'd, that was one of my favorite. And then starting on the east coast, these are Atlantic puffins. And you see the guy with the uh, fish in his uh, mouth there again, probably maybe 15, 20 feet tall. Again, all done in plants. This is from uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, where you can find over half a million of these puffins uh, living. And then in Nova Scotia, they're known for their fishing. That's been important uh, right from the native peoples. It's what drew early settlers, including the French in the 17th century. And this recreates a 19th century a lobsterman in his wooden dory with his wooden traps catching lobsters. And you see the either Dusty Miller and Adoratum used for white 
in alyssum, and then you see the uh, scavola blue flan fan flower, as well as ageranum, uh, blue ones for the uh, blue. So creating kind of a sea effect like the waves, it's just very dramatic. And of course, the Jacques Cartier is very important in French history and did some of the first explorations from France under King Francis I between 1534 and 1541. These are his three ships that came on his second of his three expeditions and landed near Quebec City up at the mouth of St. Lawrence. Again, you can see all the waves uh, done in plants as well just very dramatic. Now, of course, uh, timber is a very big part of Canadian history and lumberjacks, but this is no ordinary person. This is a person of legend called Joseph Montferrand, or in English, Joe Mufferaw, he's called, um, but he did Herculean tasks and was often seen uh, in Montreal and other ports like Ottawa. So, again, a huge figure. It's uh, hard to realize this is maybe 30 feet tall, and again, all done in plants. Of course, fur trading was important. Montreal is a big hub of that. Early on, you see the sea, again, of uh, blue fan flower with a canoe and the fur trader. A lot of times, these people would go out for weeks and, and maybe and months and even years um, from places like Montreal to trade with the uh, Mary Indians and bring back these furs. And this was uh, very important in the 17th through the mid 19th centuries in Canada. Now, moving further out west, you have, of course, a lot of plains, and this is a recreation with the wild horses running, with the sedges used for the main there. These were similar to ones that we saw in Montreal in 2013. But taking a closer look, it's just fabulous to see the different color sedges in the ground. Some colors spotted in with zinnias, and in the back, it uh, looks like some of uh, the rebecchias or black-eyed Susan. So just a mix of things in there for, for variety, make it, make it look kind of ecological. And then moving up to the northwest, the Northwest Territories, muck, musk oxen <laughs> have been very important there. You see the sedge, uh, brown sedge or uh, carex growing, <clears throat> not growing, yeah, growing literally on their back, but uh, to recreate the hair, the long hairs they have with wool underneath. This has been an important part of the uh, culture of the native peoples in the Northwest Territories. Uh, these actually came over the Bering uh, Strait. Uh, some 90,000 years ago, and they pretty much disappeared by the 1800s, but recent programs, reintroductions, and preservation programs have really helped the numbers come back, and now there are over 100,000 uh, in mainland tundra and the Arctic islands of Canada. So, and you really get a chance to, to see the scale, because you can see people there just to the right yeah. of these sculptures, and they're Yeah, a lot huge. of times, you know, I like to have a few people in so you can see that, you know, that's maybe 10 feet tall, you know, so a little bit bigger than they uh, probably mm -hmm. are in reality. And so, and then of course, up in that area, the Yukon, the Klondike, I may have heard of the gold rush uh, mm -hmm. of that era and panning for gold. Um, thousands went, but they were estimated only about 4,000 actually uh, struck gold up there. And it was interesting, I, I thought they had all these uh, placards that told about all these and, and one of the facts I thought was interesting is because it was so remote where these people were going the government required them to take a year's worth of provisions when they went out there before they could go and that's like a ton yeah, of a stuff lot. they had to take on horseback <laughs> and and carry across all these mountains so anyway that was uh, the uh, uh, gold up in the, and then coming back down the coast to uh, British Columbia. It's a very typical of uh, uh, what you might see, the artwork of the native peoples, the totems, but this is actually a recreation of a bronze sculpture you can see today outside the Vancouver Aquarium. It's a sculpture by uh, Bill Reed, and it uh, shows a killer whale, it's called. It's an orca or a marine mammal. Mm -hmm. Again, all those, a lot of you, so you can not imagine the thousands of those blue fan flowers and ageratum for the sea. They recreated a lot of water in all these exhibits. So that was the killer whale, and then a very different, a piano, and you say, well, what's that about? <laughs> well, the, um, Glenn Gould was uh, perhaps the most acclaimed musician in Canada, lived from 1932 to 1982. One of the things he was known for was his interpretations of J.S. Bach's keyboard works, and he always used a uh, seat as opposed to a piano bench. And you can see on the back of this, um, the you know, notes here with the GG for Glenn Gould, again, all in plants, just pretty phenomenal on this piano. So, and then um, moving right along, you, you see um, horses, which this is really not a mosaic, obviously, this is not plants plant in it, but this is made of driftwood by a British uh, sculptor, um, Heather Jantz, and um, these were, were again, similar ones in 
Montreal at the show there. And um, it's what you might call ecological art, um, with uh, the mayor called Odyssey and the cult called Hope. And then finally, then we have the uh, poppy, which uh, comes from a World War I poem by a, a Canadian army surgeon in Flanders Fields, inspired by all the carnage, yet with all these beautiful poppies. And to this day, this represents or symbolizes and, and used to honor the dead on what in Britain and uh, Canada is remembered today, what we call Veterans Day. A lot of great stories. I a mean, lot, yeah. Associated learn with just learning, at, looking at the beauty, but then learning about history exactly. as well. Exactly. Now, I understand China was involved too? Uh, China was, and uh, we'll take a quick look at some of those. Okay. Um, uh, they have a relationship with the mosaics from the beginning and wanted to celebrate their friendship with Canada. Uh, again, the, the lion dance. Uh, it's very important in a folk art there. You can see a close-up of one of the lion faces. And then some of the intricate uh, plantings. Again, these all have to be trimmed uh, and kept each week. Uh, just a lot of work to keep these looking good. Another one, uh, that one from Shanghai, this one from Beijing, uh, with dragons. And you can see a close-up of the dragon faces there. So pretty spectacular. Now you led your um, September bus tour to the Montreal Botanical Gardens, which you've done in the past. And uh, this year's theme, I understand, is dragons? Uh, it was. Uh, that sense uh, dragon mm -hmm. theme continues there. Uh, they're celebrating one of the five elements, water, and dragons are associated with that. And I brought a few pictures to show uh, this main dragon they had in the pond called Shen Long. Um, and this was the dragon that helped protect the harvest. They said when uh, Shen Long roared, that's when you heard the thunder. In the claws there, you can see some of the, even during the daytime, these are lit at night, of course, you can see, but the claws symbolize the rule of uh, imperial China. And then there's so much symbolism, then the cranes, the birds flying there, uh, symbolize longevity. And you see the tail going up and down through the water, all through the pond. There's a fisherman, hopefully, doesn't get knocked over <laughs> by that tail. And so uh, those were just some of the uh, examples. And then, of course, the main display is always very striking there uh, going in. And so these have uh, coleus, and it's probably an, a good acre or two just of these flowers. And it's worth seeing just to see something that you can't really recreate at home. But looking at detail, you can really see the globe amaranths there, the strawberry fields, which is the red one, and then the typical purple one, the little ball-shaped flowers, and then some zinnias interspersed, but kind of interplanted to create that mosaic kind of effect. And this was an idea I got, which I thought was pretty amazing. Uh, this is an All-America selection winner. So you can see a lot of new plants. And mm -hmm. I've actually grown this myself. Um, it's from New Mexico State University, hence the name New Mex. And even though it's called Easter, I thought, why not fall? Those are actually Halloween colors. Yeah. So next year, I'm going to start some from seed. An idea I brought home, the purple and the orange to grow in, in pots. Of course, they're not hardy outside. and mm -hmm. won't take frost, but I'll put them out for Halloween. There there you go. Now, that was part of a recent tour. What do you have planned for 2018? Sorry, uh, Judy, we took a full bus of folks up there, and as we hope to do this coming year, um, we have three tours lined up. Uh, first in March, the Philadelphia Flower Show, which I brought a couple of pictures to um, show of that area. And then there's one wow. uh, that is the show this last year. Um, it's about 10 acres undercover. It's the largest indoor show in the world flower show and we'll see some other things uh, in that area some of the sites one of the, these is Longwood Gardens uh, one of the world's foremost gardens of course is conservatories in March where the Easter flowers will be spectacular it's just so much to see uh, at that gardens and we'll take a tour of Philadelphia as well here's some of the orchids uh, in Longwood Gardens too and then in, um, in July uh, we have uh, Gardens of New York City tour. That's going to be with Charlie Nardozzi, and then we'll go back to see the lanterns next year. A whole new exhibit as they change each year. Uh, back in Montreal. Fantastic. Now, where can people get more information about the oh, details? I'll have those on my website. They can go check it out there. They can get on the mail list I have just for um, the tours if they want to get advance notice, but I'll also post a link to there, all the registration information, and um, actually have a discount uh, for the holidays if people want to sign up now for the March tour. Makes a great gift. It does. <laughs> That's wonderful. And so, um, you know, we have a little bit more, uh, about a min minute left. Um, you also have lots of tips um, on your website. I do, and, and actually some of the previous, um, got a lot of pictures from some of the gardens, previous years, the mosaics we mentioned earlier. 
2013, if people want to see that. Uh, of course, a lot of these shows streaming, we, we have those up there too. But a lot of tips on uh, actually growing a lot of these plants, and if you have questions, um, that's a good place to go. Hundreds of articles up there have been putting up over the years. So a great resource, and again, these uh, tours encourage people right on the home page. There's a link that says Garden Tours. Uh, link to that, and they can go right to all the regist all the details, registration information, mm -hmm. and uh, let me know if they have questions. Terrific, Leonard. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. That's our program for today. Thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence. Uh -huh.